My name is Fee, and I'm a slacker. Okay, so nobody like have any heart attacks or dropped out of shock, but I am back. <laughs> I owe you guys a birth vlog, which I'm going to do now. Um, I'm actually going to make it a little bit more than a birth vlog because we also had some NICU time, and you haven't heard from me in four months, almost four months, something like that. So, here we go. I'm just going to kind of put it all together right now. <laughs> so, let's turn back time and go back to September. The last vlog that you guys got from me was in the beginning to middle of September and um, I was in the hospital. <laughs> I was in the hospital. Um, those of you who follow my Instagram or my Facebook, I'm sure you guys have pieced together most of the story by now. I did do a lot of posts on there. Um, if you're not part of my Instagram and you want to be part of it, I will put that link below. Um, I'm Thee underscore Grams, and if you haven't already um, followed me there, I would suggest doing that because these days it is much easier for me to just post stuff quickly on Instagram. Anyhow, September. September, and we're almost at the end of the year, and here I am, finally vlogging this. <laughs> All right, September 8th. September 8th was my 34-week appointment. Um, my last vlog was about that and the hospital time. Since it's been so long, I'm just going to kind of do a quick recap. Hopefully a quick recap. You guys know me. Um, and then get right into the information that I have not put out here yet. So, September 8th, 34-week appointment. I went in for a NST, non-stress test. They strap the wonderful little round doohickeys to your belly and make sure the baby is alive and kicking and doing well and registering the way that they want him or her to do. And DJ cooperated just fine um, with a little coaxing. With a little coaxing. He does not like those, uh, he did not like those little round contraptions that they strapped onto me. So even if he was asleep after a while, he would start giving them what they wanted. So that was fine, but then, then they took my blood pressure. And if you followed part of this pregnancy, you will know that my blood pressure was kind of doing an up and down thing. It would go up, they ran some tests, they'd be okay, it would go back down, it would go back up, it would go back down. So they were watching me. Um, even my doula later admitted that she thought that preeclampsia was going to eventually get me. It was just a matter of time. And it did, because <laughs> they took my blood pressure, and I want to say it was like 160 over 100, 170 over 100, somewhere in that realm. Um, not good. <laughs> not good. So that earned me a visit to labor and delivery where they thought they were just going to be monitoring me for a few hours. Maybe the rest of the day was kind of just going to go with... Uh, how things went, and I got there, and the blood pressure had went up, I want to say to like 180, over 100-ish. So in a short matter of time, it was already going up even more. Of course, some of that was attributed to nerves, but preeclampsia can make a turn for the worse very, very quickly, and they were just not taking any chances at that point. So when it started to go up even more, they were like, yeah, you're going to stay the night. <laughs> and that turned into, by the next morning, yeah, you're not going anywhere until little man is a part of this world. <laughs> so it went from one step to the next to the next. And at that point, I really wasn't sure if I had, you know, earned a room in the hospital for a day, a week, a month. Wasn't quite sure what they were going to try to do. Um, how long they were going to try and push it, so to speak. But they had started running tests on me. If you know anything about preeclampsia, um, it most of the time it has to do with protein being dropped in your urine and your blood pressure. But if you get to the pretty nasty end of preeclampsia, it has a lot more to do with your body than just that. And that's exactly what was happening to me. Um, blood pressure was not being easily controlled. It took them, I want to say, most of a day to get it to cooperate to the point where it would stay down until my next 
uh, dose of medicine and e even then it, it would start to creep up before my next dose of medicine. So they kept having to increase the dosage. Um, I wasn't anywhere near the top amount that they can possibly give you of that high blood pressure medicine, but they just did not like the fact that I was not responding to it very well. And it seemed like whenever they would get it under control, my body would just go, hey, we're going to make it even worse for you. Watch this. Um, so there was that. Uh, they did a 24-hour urinalysis while I was there. And the protein, I don't remember exactly what the unit of measurement is, but it's supposed to be like 500 or under. I'm, I'm doing this by memory, so forgive me. Um, and I want to say mine was like 2,500. It was pretty nasty. Uh, past that, all the other blood tests and whatnot they were doing on me was showing uh, my uric acid was going very high up there, which had to do with uh, my liver, which is something else preeclampsia can start to affect. My platelet count had started to drop. That's another thing that can happen. And my kidney function was not doing well at all. To the point where I also earned myself a couple of specialists while I was in the hospital regarding those things. So pretty much everything was kind of going to hell in a handbag. Um, and they said, yeah, we're going to induce you. We're going to induce you, but we need to try and get all of this standard control for 48 hours because they wanted to give me the steroid shots for DJ's lungs. I was 34 weeks what I didn't know about those steroid shots is that at 34 weeks, that's kind of like the borderline as to whether or not some doctors will bother giving you those steroid shots. Um, I don't remember the particulars, but it has to do with when the lungs start to do certain things during the baby's stages of growth. And at that point, what the steroid shots are trying to enhance relating to growth has sometimes already started. So if that's the case, the steroid shots after 34 weeks do not always, don't always get you as much bang for your buck, so to speak. So sometimes they don't bother giving them to you after 34 weeks. Prior to 34 weeks, apparently they're supposed to work wonders. So that's the story on that. They decided to give them to me anyways because why not? And we waited 48 hours for them to do their thing. Um, I was pretty much being monitored like a hawk for those 48 hours. Did not get much sleep. They were literally coming in every, what seemed like every hour. <laughs> um, just running my blood pressure and checking things and whatnot. So they were keeping a very close eye on me. Um, so that brings us to, I'm going to go... Let's jump to the night of September 10th. They decided they were going to try and prepare my cervix. They had done a quick ultrasound. They verified DJ was head down. They knew I wanted to try and do a vaginal delivery. They knew I wanted to try and do it naturally. I wanted to see what I was capable of. Those of you who have followed me know that I did take hypno babies classes and whatnot. Um, not all of the doctors that I ran into and specialists and nurses and all that stuff were kind of keen to it. They kind of thought it was kind of this thing that didn't happen very often for people to try and do it without any help whatsoever. But um, they they were on the train with me despite the they despite them thinking that I would be able to do it or not. They were willing to let me try. But being 34 weeks, my cervix was long and shut. And there, there, it was showing no signs of wanting to cooperate. Um, my doula at that point felt that once they started giving me Pitocin and whatnot, that my body might actually cooperate because in her experience, she has found that preeclamptic mamas, the bodies tend to try and cooperate because they know that it's sick and it needs help, so to speak. Um, mine did not do that. <laughs> we all know if my body can do something 
in a way that is unexpected, it's going to do it because that's just the way my body works. But I'll get to that in a minute. Um, so that night of September 10th, they did try to prepare my cervix with something called laminaria, which I liked the idea because it is more natural than, say, Cervidril, I believe it is, that they tend to use. Laminaria are pretty much bamboo sticks. They look like tampons, only they're green. They have the strings and everything. <laughs> and they put a bunch of those up into your girly parts, and they go into the cervix. And sometimes, if you're not, if you haven't already earned a hospital stay, sometimes they will send you home with those little babies up there for 24 hours. In my case, they just wanted them in for the night and hoped that they would start to do their thing. Because if you're lucky, when they go to take them out, you might already be two or three centimeters dilated. Well, by the next morning, didn't do a thing. First of all, when they put those things up there, wow. That's all I'm going to say. Wow, because first of all, you don't really want anybody poking around up in there at that stage of the pregnancy. Everything is very sensitive, um, very tender. In my opinion, anything that may not have bothered me in the past, like, say, a speculum, probably would not have bothered me before, but it, it felt pretty bad at that stage of the game. And they did have to use a speculum when they went to go put those little guys up there. And, um, yeah, it, 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 I don't suggest it. It wasn't fun. <laughs> the doctor that did it said that normally he has to peel the women off of the ceiling. Um, he did say I did pretty well considering, but I, I, yeah, I don't know. I don't know how well I think I did because man, it was, it was pretty rough. <laughs> but like I said, by the next morning when they took those little babies out, they had partially expanded like the top half of them had expanded and didn't really do a thing I was not dilated at all whatsoever so at that point they said all right well we're gonna try the Pitocin now let me back up a second here um, if you watch my last vlog and you followed me before you know that I had found out kind of at the last minute that my hospital does allow laboring in the water they do allow um, water births with the right doctor, which I did not have at the time, but that was fine. Um, but they had some rooms with tubs in them, and it was just a matter of getting a room with a tub for you to be able to possibly use it to labor in the water, which the hospital did allow you to do. Well, <laughs> I did end up getting a room with a tub, which kind of sucked because I wasn't allowed to use it. The hospital's rules were if you're preeclamptic, if you're having blood pressure issues, they don't want you to go anywhere near those tubs, and that was pretty much that. Whether your doctor wanted it or allowed it, in general, the hospital said no, and that was the end of that story. So I got to be in one of these awesome, spacious tub rooms, and I didn't get to use the tub. <laughs> so anyhow, they, they did give me the Pitocin. And I want to say it was nine or ten hours of that. And I never actually hit active labor. I was in labor. I did feel some pretty wonderful <laughs> labor pains. Um, which actually, I, I really didn't think they were that bad. I, I, you know, you go into this not knowing what a labor pain feels like. And you ask people and they try and describe it. And any description doesn't really do it justice because the feeling of a labor pain is just it's like nothing else so I was actually expecting worse and what I did feel I didn't think was that bad now that may be because I wasn't in active labor but I did see that little monitor go up pretty dang high <laughs> when I was getting the uh, birth waves that I, I did experience problem is they can only give you so much Pitocin and once you hit the top end of that they have to say okay you're done we can try again and that is exactly what happened I, I hit the top end of the the amount of Pitocin they could give me and I was not really even in, in active labor they checked me I had was literally maybe one centimeter dilated the body was just not cooperating at all 
at that point they told me they said well we can try again tomorrow or we can try again later if you want um like in the middle of the night because by this point it was getting close to evening time and that's when we started asking questions because again i'm going to back up a second here the knowledge that i already had of preeclampsia was kind of scary um, I have a sister-in-law that was preeclamptic during both of her pregnancies. And with one of them, maybe both, I don't remember, but at least one of them, she did hit what you call HELP syndrome. It's H-E-L-P-P. -P. It is an acronym for something. Do not ask me what it stands for because I don't remember. <laughs> um, but it's pretty much the end of preeclampsia that can kill you. Preeclampsia can kill you if it goes unchecked. HELP syndrome is where it gets pretty dang nasty. Um, it, it will try and shut down your organs if, if, if it goes unchecked. Like I said, I was already having some pretty nasty effects to my liver and my kidneys. And I knew that if I did cross over into HELP syndrome, that the only option I would be given is a C-section under general anesthesia. And in my hospital and in many hospitals, if you're having a C-section under general anesthesia, first of all, you're obviously not going to know or see anything. And in most cases, your partner is not allowed to be in the room. They have to wait outside. So nobody would have gotten to see, nobody that mattered, <laughs> would have gotten to see any part of DJ's birth. Um, and I really didn't want that. I really didn't want that, but there, there, there's another part of this <laughs> that was at play, and I'll get to that in a second. Um, it, it, it was a hard decision for me to make because they left it in my court. They said, "Do you want to try again?" And essentially, risk your numbers getting worse. Um, that, that, that was the risk I would take if I said I wanted to try again with the server drill, for example, and, or. Do I want to go in for a C-section? And it that was a really, really hard decision for me to make for numerous reasons. I really wanted a vaginal birth. I really wanted to try. I wanted to see what I was capable of. Um, you know, it's it's there's a lot of emotions that go through your brain at that point because of just everything that's going on. And while I know this isn't true, at the time I felt like I didn't want to jump the gun too quickly with that kind of decision. I didn't want to make it seem like to myself or to anybody else for that matter that I was taking the easy way out, that I wasn't trying. All of those kind of crazy thoughts cross your mind and those were in my mind. But I will say the number one thought that was in my brain was fear. I did not get a chance to explain to you guys why I had taken hypnobabies classes and all of that natural stuff. Um, I, I briefly mentioned it in my last vlog, but I was terrified of an epidural or a spinal. And I don't scare easily. And when I say terrified, I mean terrified. Terrified doesn't even cover it. Look, just look at my face. Terrified. Um, I don't really have an explanation for that other than the fact that I have a bad back. I have a herniated ruptured disc and I have another disc that's considered a black disc. And I, I know that they do those procedures a zillion times a day. They've been done millions upon millions of times throughout history. But that just didn't matter to me. It really didn't because I was just, I was scared. I did not want that needle anywhere near my back. And it wasn't a needle thing, because needles really don't bother me anymore. <laughs> they really don't. But where it was going really freaked me out. Really freaked me out. And that is the decision that I was I was faced with. And it was hard. It was really hard. Do I risk it? Do I not risk it? Um, do we try again? Do I say, no, enough's enough, let's go for the C-section? And in the middle of all of this, 
I, I'm, I'm gonna do I'm gonna do a shout out here, and I hope she doesn't mind. Um, in the middle of all of this, I get a text from Lisa, Lisa TTC, uh, Lisa Marie TTC, um, and she sends me a message that, if I remember correctly, said, "You beat infertility. Don't let that stupid needle change anything," which essentially to me meant don't don't let don't let the fear of that needle make the decision for me. Um, and at the time, it really helped. It really did. And I knew what the right answer was. And the right answer was not to risk it and to have the C-section. And I faced my fear and I made that decision and that was that. And my husband will tell you that he was partially in shock, partially in awe. He did not think I was going to be able to do that. He didn't think I was going to be able to go through with it because he knew how scared I was. <laughs> and, um, all right, so when I had went into the hospital, I did give them a birth plan. I, I, I knew most of it was going to get thrown out the window, but at that point... <laughs> But I did give it to them just in case something like this happened. Because on my birth plan, I literally had in big red letters, I don't want an epidural. I don't want a spinal. Um, but if that happens, you need to know you will have a train wreck on your hands. And it's literally how I stated it on the, um, the birth plan. So they knew what they were about to deal with. And my husband and I, we prepped for the... Uh, being brought into the C-section room, and I, I, I get, I'm brought in there first. He was brought in there a little bit later after the procedure had started already, and <laughs> I don't know how else to say this. There really is no politically correct way of saying this, but they, uh, they sat me on the table. I had already previously talked to the anesthesiologist. I, he, he seemed great to me, which helped ease my mind just a little bit. Uh, and they gave me a nurse who was going to help keep me calm. <laughs> and she gets in front of me, and again, I don't know how else to say this, but she was she was a big girl. She was a big girl. <laughs> and she puts both of her arms out and says, squeeze. And I was like, I'm going to hurt you. <laughs> and she's like, you don't scare me. You ain't going to hurt me. Squeeze. It was... It was pretty hysterical, it was, um, and, it, and it, it, it was just enough humor at just the right amount of time. Um, and that was it. They put that needle in my back, and I, I, was, I, I don't know how anybody stays still like you're supposed to while having a contraction. I, I didn't have to do that. I just had to stay still because, like I said, my body hadn't cooperated with the Pitocin. And just staying still in general while they're putting that needle in your back, it, 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 it seems impossible. But you do it. You do it at the time. Um, I, I will say I didn't like the way it felt. I did not like the way it felt at all. I kind of felt something kind of going in me all on the right side of my back as it was whatever it is was being pushed in there. It, it was a little freaky, but in reality, in comparison to everything else, it was a short amount of time to deal with something like that. And, you know, the next thing I knew, the lower half of my body felt very heavy. <laughs> it was kind of one of those things where at first you're like, okay, if I think about this really hard, I can move my toe. And then after a few minutes, that, that ain't going to work either. Because it literally just felt like the lower half of your body was cement. It's not like you can't feel that the lower half of your body is there or isn't there. It just it just feels like cement. You can't move it. You can't feel anything. Um, and I don't know if it was the various drugs or what I had to endure the following day, which I will get to in a minute. Um, but... I don't remember a whole lot of what happened in that C-section room. I remember the important parts. Um, and when I say that, it, it was weird. It kind of felt like the whole thing was like 15 minutes. And I know it was longer than that. <laughs> um, I barely remember my husband walking in, but I do remember him being there. And I remember that cry. 
I remember that hearing that first cry, and that that that's the important memory. Um, they had me obviously laying on the table. They 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 want your arms like like this, and a lot of hospitals will tie your arms down. They didn't do that for me, but they they told me I couldn't move my arms, otherwise they were going to tie them down. And <clears throat> when DJ came out, um, Donnie got to hold him. And the uh, the anesthesiologist was kind of like up and above me on this side, and he was taking pictures down while I was laying, and Donnie was next to me with pulling the baby. I'll put that picture up here. Um, it, it was it was pretty awesome. It was. But past that, the other things I remember is I remember the odd sensations of them feeling like what was literally them pulling him out of me, and it 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 my sense of humor kind of kicked in at that particular moment and I said that the Culver's special shake of the day was a fee shake. Anybody who has a Culver's in their state is probably laughing right now, but that's literally what it felt like. It felt like I was being shaken and jostled around and being pulled up off of the table, even though I know that's not what was really happening, but that's what it felt like. It was, it was a really strange sensation. Um, so DJ was breathing when he came out. And, and that was amazing because he was six weeks early. They told us that it would be a miracle if he didn't need NICU time. Which was the other reason why I uh, made that decision with not being, not risking it to the point where I could have ended up under general anesthesia was because I knew the chances were they were going to have to whisk him away. Um and get him to the NICU, which they did. They did. Uh, we, but we did get a few minutes, and um, Donnie got to hold him right after he was taken out of me, and it was amazing. It really was. So, DJ was born at 8.27 p.m. on September 11th, and he was exactly 4 pounds and 16 and a half inches long. Now, a lot of people have asked us what we felt about having a 9-11 baby. And honestly, we loved it. We loved it because that day needed a little sunshine. And from this day forward, 9-11 will have a little sunshine. That goes by the name of DJ. <laughs> um, in our opinion, you know, he's a little miracle. He's a little sign of hope. And if there was ever day that needed that, 9-11 is it. After that, after that, the memories get really fuzzy. The memories get really fuzzy. I Like I said, I remember the important things, that, that little cry. Uh, it's, it's, it, there, there's no way to describe that wonderful feeling. But after that, the memories do get fuzzy. And that is because one thing I did not know about the stage of preeclampsia I was at, or if they do this with anybody who has preeclampsia, I, I honestly don't know, is that you're at risk for seizures for 24 hours after delivery. Did not know that. So what a lot of doctors and hospitals will do is they will give you something called a magnesium drug. It literally slows your brain down. And you have to be on this for 24 hours. Pretty much you end up bedridden with catheter. Because, I, you know what, I really can't even describe to you properly what that made me feel like. It was awful. It, it, I mean, take any occurrence, like the worst occurrence of the flu you've ever had and multiply it by like 10. It just felt horrible. And I don't have a very good recollection of those next 24 hours. I don't. Um, and what that also means is because DJ was in the NICU and I was on the magnesium drip, I did not get to hold him for 24 hours. And that was the longest day of my life. Even though I don't remember a lot of it, because of the effects of that crazy medicine, um, it still felt like the longest day of my life. <laughs> Uh, yeah, that stuff is just nasty. It's, it's just plain old nasty. I, it, 
it, there's these like waves of nausea and at the same time it kind of felt like if someone told me go to sleep I could like instantly fall asleep that quick. Um, I know there were numerous people that came to visit me that day. I had to be reminded later on who came because I didn't remember. I, I remembered very little of those 24 hours. So after 24 hours of that magnesium drip, they told me, they said, all right, we're going to take you off of the stuff. We're going to let you sit for about an hour, and then we're going to toss you into, and I'm already starting to tear up here. <laughs> uh, then we're going to toss you into a uh, wheelchair and get you down to the NICU. Um, I'm going to put some pictures up here. There are no words. And I believe I put that on Facebook. There are no words to describe how I felt. It was amazing. I believe my post for this said, there are no words. If I am dreaming, let me sleep forever. And that about sums it up. <laughs> I'm so cheese, honey. You're on video. I love you. I love you. He is so stinking adorable. <laughs> I will say that uh, I had to hand him off to his grandmother, who wasn't there with me. I think three times and within 15 minutes because that medicine was still messing with me. I would get these waves just of nastiness and I was, he was so tiny. I was afraid I was going to drop him because, or he was going to slip out of my arms because of these just nasty waves of, I guess I'll call it medicine head. Um, And I, I was not feeling well yet at all. I, I kind of felt like I could have, like, chucked my guts out any second. Hate to say it that way, but it's it's the truth. Um, but despite all of that, the first time I held him, that's another moment I will never forget. It was just amazing. It really was. That's my birth story, essentially. That's my birth story right there. Um, I'm going to continue on here and try and quickly do this because I see that this video is going to be a long one. But hey, you guys haven't heard from me in four months, so here we go. <laughs> um, DJ did end up in the NICU. He was in the NICU for 14 days. Now, they had told us that that was to be expected, that a lot of babies don't get out of the NICU until their actual birth date, projected birth date, which would have been six weeks. So two weeks, not so bad. I will say he was a little four pound fighter. He was a fighter and a half, um, despite his tiny little size, <laughs> because they automatically put him on what they call room air. He did not need oxygen, but they automatically put him on room air. Um, because that's just what they do. That's what they do in the NICU. And actually, I should rephrase that. They did put him on oxygen, but it was a very short time for them to see that they did. he didn't need it, and they kept dropping it down and dropping it down until he was just on room air. And then he was off of the room air after 48 hours. So his, his little lungs were great. I don't know if it was those steroid shots or if he was just making sure that his little lungs were ready. I um, his IV was out a day, day and a half after that. So what that left him with at that point was just all of the monitors and a feeding tube. And that's really what left him in the NICU for two weeks was the feeding thing. He, he did not do well with the whole suck, swallow, and breathe at the same time, which is very common for little ones. Um, he tried and it, uh, he had some problems at first. Um, despite all of that, 
I can tell you that I did attempt to breastfeed numerous times. And despite his tiny little size, he literally fit from here to here. <laughs> um, he had one heck of a latch, but he just did not want to work for his food. <laughs> um, it tired him out very quickly. I ended up um, exclusively pumping. And I will say that I did find one thing that my body did well without doctor intervention, and that was and that was produced milk. <laughs> I had caught up to his need and surpassed it by day three, which all of the nurses and doctors and NICU people were like, whoa, because apparently C-section is one way for your milk supply to not do well. And being as early as 34 weeks is another way for your milk supply not to do well. And the first 24 hours not being anywhere near your baby is another way, right, way for your milk supply not to do well. So, despite those obstacles, I did do well. Um, and without getting into details, because I'm not really ready for that right now, um, DJ was on breast milk for seven weeks. And then he ended up with an issue, and I ended up with an issue, and that's another story for another day. But he did end up with breast milk for seven weeks, and I firmly believe that that is what helped him get out of that NICU as quickly as he did. And as soon as we got him home, he didn't take long to start putting on the weight, but I'll get to that in a minute. Um, NICU. You know, while I was there, I said to people numerous times that this journey, this TTC journey and IVF and dealing with all of that for as long as we did, it's hard. It's hard. But I got to tell you, NICU is a whole different kind of hard. I'm not saying it's any better or any worse. It's, it's equally as hard. It's just a whole different kind of hard to watch that tiny little human being have all of those wires coming out of them and you know when they're hooked up to those monitors you're constantly watching those monitors and you know trying to understand everything that's going on that the doctors are doing that the nurses are doing and 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 NICU nurses those are angels and scrubs let me tell you every single last one of them was amazing and I know anybody that has had a child in the NICU will say the same thing. NICU nurses are angels and scrubs, and that's all that's to it. But I will say that we we were very lucky. We were very lucky. We we counted our blessings, and, and we, we were thankful for all of our blessings because, man, you go in and out of that NICU. We were there every day. We boarded a room from the hospital um, and I was there for just about every feeding. I think there was a couple that I missed in the middle of the night because I was just thoroughly exhausted. But, you know, we were in that NICU a lot for two weeks. That's where I lived. And you go in and out of that NICU and some of the things you see I told people, you walk through there, you want to say 15 prayers in two different languages and throw in a spell just for the sake of doing it. Because <laughs> there's some scary things going on in there with these tiny little human beings. The ones that are in covered incubators that you can't touch except through the little gloves. And it's really hard to watch. And the bells and the whistles and the alarms are constantly going off for one baby or another. It's scary. It is. It's scary and it's heartbreaking. And it pulls at every heartstring you've got. And even if you think you're emotionally strong, when you're put in that situation, nobody's emotionally strong. Everyone eventually breaks. Uh, Donnie tried to be my rock. And for the most part he was. But there were a couple of times where he, he, he broke too. <sighs> But DJ made it out. DJ made it out in exactly two weeks. And when he was released, he was four pounds, two ounces. Like I said, he was born four pounds. Um, when most babies are born, they lose some weight. And, and he did lose some weight. And he had went down to three pounds, ten ounces, which I know that sounds scary. It is. 
because when you're dealing with a baby that tiny, they've got no leeway room for anything funky going on. He needs to gain weight, and he needs to gain weight quick. Um, and he did have a little bit of a hard time just because of the eating thing at first. At first, he, he was barely gaining any weight back, plus he had some uh, issues with those Nasty little Billy Rubens, um, but they took care of that, and when he came home, he was four pounds, two ounces. <laughs> and it was exciting to finally bring our baby home, but at the same time, it was terrifying. <laughs> he was so tiny. I, I've We'd never been through this before. We were first-time parents. I mean, you want to talk about trial by fire. He was so little. But not for long. Not for long. He started put on the weight like a champ. And and he is now currently I'm gonna say he's about twelve pounds. He hasn't uh he hasn't been officially weighed. He'll be officially weighed by the doctor in a couple of weeks. But based on what we can tell, based on, you know, just standing on our scale with and without him and doing the math, he's about twelve pounds now. So he he's catching up. Um the only issues he has had is he's had some issues with his neck. And that is because, despite being a six-week preemie, his, his little head, it, it ain't so little. <laughs> um, the doctors generally, uh, they adjust his age, they subtract the six weeks, and they do all of the measurements and the percentiles for of all the various things um, based on that. And... His age has to be adjusted for him to properly hit those scales, though he is on the uprise. He, he is catching up. But the one thing they never had to adjust his age to actually get him on the scale, smack in the middle of the scale actually, is his head. The size of his head did not have to be adjusted. <laughs> um, though they did. They did just so that it, they would all have proper measurements based on the same age. But that being said, he needed a little extra time and a little extra work with the muscles in his neck so they didn't end up with torticollis. And um, he is doing really well. He is doing really well. He's um, Finally, we are doing okay with tummy time, even though he hates it. But he is lifting his head up at just about 90 degrees. Um, not for long. We're working on the whole time issue, how long he's able to do it for. But he is he's doing great. He, he is doing great. Um... Like I said, he did have some issues with feeding that kind of came to a head at week seven, having to do with breast milk and not breast milk and whatnot, but we've worked all of that out as well, and he's doing great. As for me, um, I'm, I'm doing all right. I'm doing all right. Uh, there were two things of note that I can put out here. Um... Many of you know that if, if you followed me that I had, I, I had, I couldn't feel my hands by the end of that. All of that has went back to normal. It took about six weeks for that to go back to normal. It, it was weird. The, you know, my wrists almost felt instantaneously better. And I would say about a week after DJ was born, I had all the feeling back except for the very tips of my fingers. And the tips of my fingers took about another five weeks, so six weeks total, to completely get all of this back to normal. So I did not end up with um, pregnancy-induced carpal tunnel that all went back to normal. But the one thing that did pay the price was my feet. <laughs> I, I believe I had said in some of the updates that my feet just flat out hurt once I got into the third trimester. I'd stand up and it felt like, like every bone in my foot was just screaming it it didn't go away it actually got worse and I ended up going to the podiatrist and I have plantar fasciitis <laughs> um so I've got orthotics in my shoes um I am a shoe girl those of you who followed me from way back um I'm a shoe girl and most of my shoes are kind of sitting stagnant <laughs> it's athletic shoes for me and that's it right now it, the problem may or may not go away. Uh, the podiatrist has said that he can't even begin to count how many mamas and pregnant ladies he has had to give orthotics to, and sometimes it goes away, sometimes it doesn't. So it's a roll of the dice. 
Um, the rest of my preeclampsia stuff, I was seeing a lot of specialists concerning my kidney function and my uh, high blood pressure and whatnot. High blood pressure runs on both sides of my family, so that was another roll of the dice as to whether or not that would go away. A couple of the doctors were saying that they didn't think it would, that it may have just finally caught up with me, but it did. And that was about at week 10 it finally subsided. I am off of all of that medication and my blood pressure is good to go. Oh, there was one other thing that I did not mention that I probably should. C-section. The other thing about the C-section. Like I said, if my body can do anything funky, it's going to do it. And this happened about a week after DJ was born. Um, I had staples. I had stitches on the inside and staples on the outside. And they kept the staples in for five days, six days, five days, six days, right in there somewhere. DJ was born on a Friday and they were taken out the following Friday. And at that point, I was no longer a patient at the hospital, but like I said, we were boarding a room, so we were in the hospital, just not as patients. And the following morning, Saturday morning, went to the bathroom, which at that point, you know, after a C-section, everything's a little tender down yonder. Everything's a little tender in your midsection also. So I was, I was still slow moving, but I was moving. And I go into the bathroom, go to take care of whatever I've got to take care of at that point. And I was sitting on the toilet at the time. And I went to reach down very tenderly to get my pants and pull them up. And I got about halfway down to where my pants were. And I literally heard... And I felt it, though I can't really, I can't really describe if it was painful or not. I think I just kind of went into shock. My C-section incision burst open. And I'm not going to lie, I'm not going to exaggerate, it literally looked like a horror flick. It did. Um, what at the time I thought was blood literally just gushed out, projectile, out of me. It was everywhere. It was all over the bathroom. Um, all over the walls, all over the floor. Um, thankfully, it was it was hospital bathroom, so of course there's a little sewer in the center, and it was there was a walk-in shower. So all of that was tiled. What I ended up having is what they call a seroma. Pretty much, if you're not a size two and they cut into you for a C-section, they're cutting into fat cells. And when that happens, the fat cells tend to weep. So you have all this excess liquid inside of you. A normal body would have just reabsorbed all of that. Mine did not. And I did kind of have like an extra roll down there. I, I couldn't really tell just how bad it was because I was still rather swollen down there. But the doctors knew that I had this essentially pack of liquid going on and they were watching it they were just hoping that it would reabsorb I was due to see the doctor go back to the doctor a week after my staples were taken out I, I had I had a lot more than just you know the six week visit I, I had a whole bunch of visits in there and once this happened I had even more visits <laughs> pretty much the amount of liquid and the seroma just got to the point where it needed to go somewhere and it burst open the c-section incision and that's when it all came out and it once they explained it to me i realized it wasn't all blood a lot of it was just liquid it was just tinged red so of course at the time we really freaked out i literally i really think i went in shock i really did and all my husband could do at that point was run out into the hallway and grab the first person in scrubs because I, I was not a patient at the time. So that that was fun. Let me tell you, it was really fun. The part that kind of stinks about that whole ordeal when that happens is they don't stitch you back up. They want it to heal from the inside out, which means you're left packing it and kind of taping where you can to get the packing to stay in place until it stops weeping, which for me was weeks. I don't remember exactly, but you know, we were in the NICU for two weeks. It was still weeping when I came home. I, I want to say it was like four weeks. 
four or five weeks of it weeping. Um, there was another occurrence where it did gush, not as badly as the first time it happened, but there, there, there was another time where it did that, and the rest of it was just slight weeping the entire time until it started to heal from the inside out. I can tell you that even now, at 15 weeks, um, there is a tiny, itty bitty little spot right in the center where I can feel probably about the size of the tip of my pinky that's not quite closed. So it's a very, very slow process when that happens. But that's it. That's my story. That's my story. That's DJ's story. Um, we are doing well. And I am very sorry that it took me forever to get on here and finally post this and finally record this. Um, I, I, I fully admit to mommyhood completely taking me off guard. <laughs> um, I, I, well, I was home for 12 weeks. I was home for 12 weeks and it took all of those 12 weeks for me to get my bearings back because I, I'm a schedule person. I am. I, you know, I do this, then I do this, then I do this. You put a baby in that mix, the schedule goes right out the window. <laughs> and it just, it took me quite a while to get used to that. Um, and my, my whole world was about this little human being that I brought home that was so tiny at the time. He was, you know, I'm going to, I'm just going to say it that while, while I wanted to do videos, it just, it just didn't happen. <laughs> it just didn't happen. Um, though I'm going to try to get on here a lot more often than once every four months. And I, there are videos that I want to do. I want to do a, uh, pretty much an all encompassing favorites video of the last four months, the things we used during the NICU and the things that we use, um, that we can't live without at home. And I want to do a uh, nursery tour, though you are seeing part of it behind me. I know you guys heard me talk about this canopy that I was going to use for my crib to keep our kitties out. It's working wonderfully, so there's your first shot at that. And I know there's a couple other videos that I want to do that I have a list going. I have a list going, and hopefully I will, I will start doing all of them. It just, it needs to go on my do list. It just needs to go on my do list for the day so that it gets done. Um, but thank you for still saying subscribe to me. Thank you for watching this. Um, if you have gotten to the end of this, kudos to you because I see how long this is going to be. Um, thank you for the support. Thank you for the love. And as always, you are all still in my prayers. Um, your turns are coming. Do not, do not give up. This is why you don't give up. This is why you don't give up. Because something like this just might happen. Alright, I will talk to you guys later. I promise, I promise I will talk to you guys later. <laughs> Thanks. Bye.